Hey guys, Brett Williams here from lifewithoptions.net. Welcome to another episode of the LWO Show podcast. Today, my special guest is Nikki Urchel. She is here to share her story about going from a business law degree and now transitioning into becoming a therapist and coach. So Nikki, welcome. How are you going? Hi, I'm so glad to be here. I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. Most welcome. And as I said earlier, just off camera, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for uh, coming on here from some random reaching out to you on Instagram. I, I was following what you're doing, absolutely loving the content that you're putting out there. Oh. I really just wanted to get you on here to share your story. Thank you. I was so honored that you asked me. I'm, like I said earlier, I love to be able to share my story and like, you know, spread the word and be able to help people however I can. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there's going to be plenty of value in this, in this chat. So Let's just dive straight in. So, you know, start from wherever you want to start, whether it is the back in the university stage or maybe there's another part that you want to start from. You know, let's just start to dive into the, what led you to be where you are today. What are some of the challenges that you've been through? What's some of the internal, um, you know, processes that you went through? Um, and let's just see what value it can bring forth for, for those who are watching. And um, I have no doubt there's going to be plenty full. I know. I'm like, where should I start? Um, well, you mentioned the the degree and the kind of career path and so maybe I'll I'll start there because that's sort of I think a lot of times especially when I'm working with young people they really get struggle like kind of hit a struggle bus when it comes to like choosing a path and I always tell people where you start is not where you're going to end up like and that's actually the best part is that you can choose a major you can choose a college you can choose you know a state to live in that has nothing to do with where you're going to eventually end up um, if you just let kind of your higher self lead you so. Uh, I entered college and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I ultimately landed in business. I went to kind of a business heavy school, really was interested in law. And so I decided, well, I'm a pretty smart cookie. I guess I'll do pre-law and learn some business and some app applicable skills. I think this song's pretty fun. Um, took the LSAT, like did pretty good on it. Uh, and then really thought hard <laughs> after I took the LSAT <laughs> if I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> so I... I was like, gosh, I really don't want to work 80 hours a week. And that was really a deal breaker for me. Uh, I wasn't afraid of going to law school or doing the work. It was more about the work-life balance that I've always valued and always looked for. Um, so much to my parents' chagrin after they had paid for my my law degree, <laughs> my free law degree <laughs> and my LSAT course, I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, I still owe them, I think, $1,200 for that one. Um <laughs> They, I decided to just kind of start interviewing around, uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the, in the United States, um, and there's a bunch of different corporations in my city, so I decided to interview with uh, Target Corporation, which is kind of like a, a department store, yep. uh, discount department store in the, or in the uh, United States, and got a job in merchandising, and I was pretty excited. I was going to make about $42,000 a year. I thought that was a lot of money back then. I was like, yes, I'm going to buy a debt ski and <laughs> big plans. Um, and quickly, quickly found out I was not cut out for corporate America. I was too, uh, I just couldn't pretend. Like I couldn't put the face on. I couldn't, I couldn't get with this whole idea that like, you had to be a different person at work than you were in your personal life. And it really, I went into a pretty like, gnarly spiral like I didn't understand like where I had gone wrong I didn't get like what I was supposed to do next I had done all the right things I had graduated from school I had taken all the tests I had gotten the perfect job and I wasn't happy yep and you know my parents they're, they've been so amazing to me they've been so supportive of my pretty adventurous lifestyle they were just like stay for a year and figure it out and so I did I took that advice because what I what I believe now, and I really didn't understand it back then, was you actually, I think, learn, well, not I don't think, I know, you learn more from the things that you um, don't love and the things you don't like. You learn so much more about yourself. You learn so much more about your inventory, about, you know, what drives you and where your passions lie. It happens in the, like, the, the grout of life when you're not loving it. So it, it forces you to have perspective. Um, so I have a lot of gratitude for that experience. And through that experience, I decided I wanted to go back to grad school to become a therapist. Um, you know, long story short, I went through kind of that personal inventory. I decided that's where I felt like I was being drawn to. Yep. So I went back to grad school. I got my degree in social work, actually. So it was a um, master's degree in social work and I put a five-year plan on myself that I wanted to be in private practice in five years from graduation. Um, 
And anybody who knows me is a very goal oriented woman. So I set that plan out pretty um, intensely. And uh, within four years, I was in private practice doing that and uh, loving it. So proud of myself. I was like, I did it. Like I accomplished my goals. And it was four years of my life that I really enjoyed. So excuse me, I uh, sat up practice. I was in a consortium with other practitioners and was so, you know, excited about what I was doing. I was thriving. My practice was doing really amazing. And um, oh gosh, it was about last summer, or actually, I'm sorry, it was about this summer, it was like fall, summer kind of 2016, that I just started to kind of get a little bit of a something's missing like there's something missing and I don't know what comes next I've always been I've always been the person that like pushes herself like where are you in your life now and how did your career match where you are and so I just started asking the questions like what do I want to do and coaching had always been something I incorporated into therapy so it was seemed like a pretty natural evolution for me to take it outside of the traditional therapy model which is like sitting across from a person you know, staring them face to face and having 45 minutes with them every other week like it wasn't enough and like the relationship aspect was so limited like I couldn't I couldn't have a relationship with my clients outside of that space and it it hindered progress and it hindered my ability to get people to where I knew they were capable of being um, it also limited the scope of what I could talk about like I couldn't talk about energy and spirituality as much as I wanted to where I couldn't incorporate the ideas of law of attraction or I couldn't incorporate the ideas of like um you know meditation as much as I, I mean it's more common now in therapy but mm. there seem to be more limitations and I hate limitations <laughs> <laughs> I loathe them I just want to bust them out so um I started I started asking my question my questions like where do where are my people like how do I help the most people and so that's where I started to find myself online more because that's, that's where the people are. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just curious just to take one step back into the, the therapy side of things. Like I have sure. like, in my own personal journey, I did start out. Um, my ex and I went to a couple's counselor and a few other things. Mm. And I, I did a couple of sessions afterwards. And I must admit from my own personal experience, I found it uh, more frustrating than anything um, from a, a client yeah. perspective, because I just didn't feel as though I got any tools or anything like that to actually move through anything. Mm -hmm. And um, it was almost that stereotypical of like, oh, how does that make you feel type questions. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I, I didn't even know what's going on in my head. Like, give me more, more than that. And um, <laughs> I think like from what you're saying there, it's, it, it, well, and I understand as well, it's a highly regulated industry that therapists are not mm -hmm. allowed to work be out outside the boundaries of they like, just mm -hmm. out of interest just sort of sharing a little bit more light on uh, i know you did make mention that you couldn't speak about the coaching stuff or the um the spirituality and all of that side of things like um mm -hmm. the limitations that are there and do you kind of feel and i i think you probably would lean towards it because you transitioned away from it do you almost feel like it's a broken model or do you still feel as though there's a place for it I believe that everybody enters the journey at different places. So I think that there is absolutely a place for it um, because I think that there are people who need that rigidity mm -hmm. and that there are people who respond really well to um, relational boundaries that exist in a therapy setting, um, that that power dynamic works for them. I really do believe that there is an absolute place for it. And I still see clients in that capacity sometimes and I know that I could never work with them in a coaching relationship because they aren't capable they're not mentally well enough to necessarily um understand personal boundaries or uh, physical boundaries or like do the work that I'm really drawn to doing right now so 100% I see the the need and the place for it I think you know that that old I don't remember oh I'm gonna sound like such a ding dong right now but that that saying like you can never go home again I think that like when you know more, it's like you can't unknow it. And so for me, it's like what I know in my heart that I believe so strongly in and that I know works for people. I can't do that with people who aren't there yet. And that's not saying they're in a bad place or in the wrong place. It's just that that's not the people I'm speaking to anymore. Um, if that makes sense. It does. It totally does. Um, mm -hmm. So then for, for anybody who's watching the um this conversation and just sort of sitting there on the on the edge of going okay which path do I go down there's a whole mm -hmm. heap of you know life coaching titles are being thrown around everywhere <laughs> you 
you know, I don't I know. know. <laughs> um, and look, I, even for myself, I'm kind of like, oh, I, I cringe whenever somebody refers to myself as, as a life coach. And I'm like, okay, well, look, if you want to work with that. Look, if that's what you understand, that's cool. But um, right. just for the, the sake of simplicity, if we look at, say, the life coaching side of things, now I'm talking about more of a life coach who has some school, has some tools, mm-hmm. techniques, and tips behind, not mm-hmm. just somebody who's um, just d- decided to get into it tomorrow as such, but right. or a therapist. Right. Um, and if that person is going, I need to do something for myself, but doesn't know which direction to go <laughs> down, how would you mm-hmm. guide them as to which step to take and the potential... I guess outcomes that they may look from both of it, the, what the journey may look like between both of them. Mm-hmm. I love that question. I think it's so important. Um, and I will a lot of times spend some time uh, t- on my discovery call with people deciphering which one feels like the better choice for them. So I'll start with like somebody comes and they say, Hey, I'm really interested in working with you. Um, which area do you think I should go? Do you think we should do therapy or do you think we should do um, coaching? And a lot of times I'll, I'll try to, uh, or I'll evaluate first their like mental capacity and wellness. So like, are they having suicidal idea- ideation? Are they, you know, in an abusive relationship? Are they struggling with like poverty or um, like really basic needs? Like if that's the case, coaching is not the way to go. Like coaching is for well, high functioning people who have desires and goals that they know what they are, or they, they want to know what they are. Therapy is to learn about emotions, to learn about how to cope with really difficult emotions, how to um, process pain from the past. Um, A lot of times, just to make it really simple, I'll say therapy is about looking at the past and coaching is about looking towards the future. And um, it just really depends on where that person is. And a lot of times people can transition, like they can kind of go through their therapy process, they can kind of shed whatever they need to shed, they can learn what they need to learn to get them to that plateau, which then allows them to say, oh my God, like life is actually not terrible. Like, what can I do now? Like I could do anything. I could have a different relationship. I could make more money. I could have a different life. And that's the perspective I think that I hope that everyone can get to. So that, that kind of answers like the, the, tree, the tree question. Yeah, it, it does. And, you know, it's not something that I've ever necessarily thought about. Um, I only come back to my own personal experience and, and know that I didn't get much out of that. And then I dived into NLP and um, did a number of one on one sessions with a, a master practitioner through that. And that was what really propelled me forward. Um, yeah. So I'm only looking at my own personal experience. And I don't I haven't even really thought about like, would I what would I actually class the NLP mm-hmm. um, sessions as whether they're therapy mm-hmm. or whether they're coaching. And I I haven't even got that answer in this moment as a sort of going, but you know, I've, yeah. it's a very elegant way in which you describe the difference between the two. So I really appreciate mm-hmm. that because I think again, coming back to what I was saying before, there is so many different options there and there's, you know, which one is going to be the best suited. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's, you, you can always go and try it. And it also comes down to that personal interaction as well. Like who you're going to gel with is, is always mm-hmm. a massive thing too. When that's how I actually like will start off talking to either a therapy client or a coaching client is nothing can happen unless this relationship is solid. Like nothing, you can't feel safe. You can't tell me what's going on. You can't kind of, you know, let me into your world unless you feel safe. And that can only happen if this relationship is right for you. And so that's, I really truly believe that if clients aren't meant for me, that's actually the best thing for them to know. Yeah. So just to kind of speak to that, I really, I, I agree, like that has to happen. And, and a little bit about the NLP stuff, I adore, I adore that integrate or that, that, mo- that model. Um, it's so helpful. And I think in therapy, we use it. It's just called something a little bit different. So like it could be called like a little cognitive behavioral, a little dialectical, but it's just a little bit of everything mixed and mashed together, but it's done in a beautiful, really helpful way. So I love NLP. It's awesome. Yeah, it is powerful. Yeah. It's something that I, um, I do bring into my coaching to some degree, but there's still so much more of it that I want to um, re-presence myself to. Because I ended up doing, because it was working so well for myself, I, after the one-on-one mm-hmm. sessions, I was like, okay, wow. Like All of a sudden, the baggage that I was carrying around is not really an issue. So the, um, my right. coach at the time was, was running some programs. So I started to learn it and ended up doing my practitioner certification and a few things as well. So um, Awesome. Yeah, it's absolutely exciting. 
Um, I want to take a step back to the transition um, from the merchandising into the, the social work side of things. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it that was going on for yourself at the time that said, yes, this is the direction that I want to go into? Was it a case of you were, you were somebody who was naturally uh, kind of the shoulder for people when they were going through tough times? Or, um, you know, was it just the, the joy of working with people and a deep desire to help mm -hmm. people? Like, what was actually there for you that you knew that this is the direction that you wanted to transition into? a good question um so when i was in college i did a ton of volunteering I, like as a business and legal major you're focusing so much on money and yourself and it's a kind of a narcissistic major and i hate i didn't like that part about it and i needed balance so i did tons i'm not saying okay anybody on business out there i'm not saying you're narcissistic i'm just saying for me it felt like i needed some balance and i went to a university i went to a university that also required some um, volunteerism. So it was something that I was just used to doing anyways at my college. So um, throughout my four years there, I did a lot of volunteering with local schools and um, eventually became the president of our um, coordination program. So I became the president who was like placing people in different places. And, and in that role, I got to do a ton of peer to peer counseling and lots of just like advisement. Mm -hmm. It was something I just, I adored doing. And I've always had this empathetic really highly sensitive person field around me so I've always attracted people who have sought advice or see me as some kind of knower of things even well, whatever like sometimes I know and sometimes I don't but um just having that skill my whole life I I it was a little bit funny that I had never thought about therapy before um so when I was at Target and doing this look back of when was I the most happy when did I feel the most fulfilled if I could do anything in this world, what would I do? And, that, and I think what I love about that question is you can ask it at different periods in your life and the mm -hmm. answer will always be different. And like what I thought at 10 is not what I think at 35. Um, but it's just that, that alone, that question alone, when was I the happiest and what would I do if I could do anything? Because now is the time I can do anything. Yep. It was just so clear to me. So I, I talked to a couple of people in my life who also were on that similar path of, of, either going back to grad school or changing their kind of career path, um, got a little bit of, of feedback and advice, which was invaluable to me. Just having people you trust really echo back, yes, like this is, this seems like the right choice for you, um, which I always say, keep that, keep that board of directors small. Like you don't need everybody's opinion or everyone's advice, but like a couple small groups of people. Um, and so that's how I really chose as I, I, I remembered that part of college that I couldn't wait to go to that role. I couldn't wait to be the coordinator. I couldn't wait to see the people I worked with and like help be a helper. And, um, and remembering connecting with people of all different you know, races and, and like you know, economic statuses and, and genders and uh, so, like all of the things. So I was so drawn to diversity and so drawn to being a helper that that was really clear to me. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, oh, the question's gone straight out of my head. Um, talking about, <laughs> going back to bouncing the ideas off the people around you just to get the, the feedback of like, this is what I'm thinking about doing and them echoing back. Yes. That is something that would be an absolute fit. Um, mm. Was there, gosh, the question's gone straight out of my head. Uh, how did it go? Like, how do, how do you like, how do you choose those people or like, how do you like, no, it was uh, the right. Oh, where was I going with this? Um, I hate that when it happens. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking, at, as I'm asking the question, I'm also looking back in my own personal journey like of me transitioning mm -hmm. into being a coach. And um, mm -hmm. I was kind of looking for validation as to why it was a smart choice to step into it and why I was going mm -hmm. to be the right person, I suppose, in some way to step into it because... I looked back over the past couple of years and I had sort of informal, unofficial coaching conversations with friends and, and that side of things. So to some degree, mm -hmm. I did a very similar thing with like saying with some friends, this is what I'm wanting to do and mm -hmm. getting that, I guess that, that tick of approval moving forward was there. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, there's another layer to that, which is actually accepting the identity and moving into the identity of I am as a coach. Mm -hmm. Let, maybe we'll speak into that one because I can't remember where I was going with the other part. But 
um, stepping into that identity as being a coach, because I know that there's also something else that other people mm. have had a bit of a challenge with when it comes to just making that transition, because, uh, you know, maybe you're just somebody who wants to help people and, but then you've also got to start right. identifying yourself as somebody who is a business as well on some level and, and all of that. So Absolutely. what was it like yeah. actually accepting that identity as a therapist or a coach or uh, really mm -hmm. sort of stepping into that, um, that passion and purpose? Yeah. I think, you know, the initial is really exciting. You know, anytime you're, you're like, Oh, I had, you know, you said this feels like the right move. Right. I think where we've been conditioned to question our gut, like we've been conditioned to not trust it. I know I have at least. And up until I say like yesterday, like I still like have these moments of, um, is this the right thing? Like, do I, am, am I, am I hearing that right? Am I feeling that right? And so, you know, in terms of therapy, I felt very clear on it. Um, in terms of coaching, it was a little bit more murky because when you've been in a, I mean, I've been a therapist for almost 10 years. So you are conditioned to think certain ways about certain things. And like, this is how you succeed. And this is the cap of your success. And if you do this, then this is the best you can do. And I, that was the part that always bothered me, which I was like, I don't like caps. I don't, like I said, I don't like limits. I don't like rules. I don't like bosses. <laughs> I don't want anybody telling me what I can and can't do. I want to be able to make my own destiny. And in order to do that, you have to be really GD brave. Like you have to be kind of fearless, even when you're fearful, like you have to do it anyways. So in terms of the coaching thing, I would say it, it was baby steps for me. Like I would, you know, take a, I took a, I took a, co I took a coaching course. I was like, Oh, okay. So now I'm good. I got my coach now. And then I talked about it to people. And I was like, so what do you think about coaches? <laughs> I got it. Like, it was like these little baby stuff. And finally, I was like, what am I afraid of? And it's taken, I mean, Brett, I will tell you, it has taken a couple of my very close friends who are also mentors of mine yep. to like hold the mirror up and be like, Nikki, you are excellent at what you do. You serve people on such a huge level. Stop playing small and sometimes we need people to hold that mirror up for us so we can be like yeah like what have I been doing I've been playing so dang small so I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say it was easy because it wasn't and I, I I'm gonna I'm trying I've been trying to play with this because I really believe that life can be easy I really do believe we can manifest things and bring them to us with ease and at the same time, I also believe that the things we really cherish and love the most are the things we gritted for and the things we like dug in for and the things we worked hard for. Like those are the things that are like our bank account. Like, oh yeah, I did it. So <laughs> yeah. I, I cherish, I cherish that, that climb up the mountain. I really do. Um, to get to a place where I'm not, I'm not shy anymore and, and I don't want to be, I don't want to pretend like I don't know the answers because I feel like I really have a lot to share and a lot to teach people and a lot to give to this world. I, I was reading, I don't know why I did this, but I was reading the news today. It was just awful. And I just thought in my head, I was just like, we need, we need the counterbalance. We need love. Yeah. We need hope. We need the ability to see truth, light, divine thought. Like we need these things to balance whatever in the hell is going on in this planet. Like, we need, we need light workers. And so that to me was like a call to action to do more. And sorry for that tangent, but I just. There um, is no need to apologize for that tangent. It was absolutely <laughs> beautiful. So I, I just, I really, um, I love the climb and I think there will always be a climb. Yeah. Because if there isn't like, what's the point in getting up in the morning? Like, what are you working towards? This is true. This is true. Actually, as you were just sharing that, uh, it, represents myself to a, a, a comment that I used to have on the, or a, a quote that I used to have on the corner of my whiteboard in my room back in Sydney. Obviously now, as, as I said, when I reached out to you, I'm in Bali now. Living I know, the I, love Bali. I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to relax enough. I'm too busy uh, in, the, in the do of, of getting my business going in a big way as well. Yeah. So, yes. um, but the quote that I used to have written on the corner of it was, um, if you didn't care what people thought, what action would you take today? Mm -hmm. And that what you were just talking about there just sort of brought my mind back to it because we do care so much about what other people think. And it, 
and that is what stops us from actually taking action. So I would read it. Okay. I would like to say every single day, but the truth of the matter is it was it, it, like anything, a whiteboard sort of blends into the background, even if it's got your, uh, all your goals and dreams and desires written on it. So when I read it, yeah. uh, it was something that really brought me back. So I appreciate you for sharing that little tangent because that's mm -hmm. just brought it back for me and just thinking, mm -hmm. you know, where am I playing small in, in my world as well? And mm -hmm. you know, if I wasn't think, concerned about what people thought, what action would I take today? So um, yeah, I love me, that. You've just got me fired up for yes. the day. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I know it's the beginning of the day in Bali and it's like at the end of the day here. So I'm yeah. like, you have a whole day ahead of you. It's beautiful. You're in tomorrow. Um, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I love that because I think we will so often we do, uh, even though we can say, I don't care what other people think, we all do. Like to a certain extent, we've been conditioned to care a little bit um, and sometimes a lot. So it's, I love that because it, it just, again, it, it blows through preconceived notions of what is okay and what is normal and what actually matters to you. So, so I love that reminder. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, you started going down the rabbit hole. So let's continue down that spiritual one. Yes. <laughs> if we must. If we must, I will go down the rabbit hole. So, you know, speak around your spiritual journey as well. Because I know that, as you said, that that brings in a lot of uh, or spirituality is a big part of who you are as an individual. It's a big part of your coaching. And, and I think it's something that is... I, Oh, there's a lot of people waking up to it a bit like coaching but like uh, in general the whole world I think consciously is waking up and starting to explore mm -hmm. all of this a lot more so whether it is uh, somebody who's just starting to maybe feel and sense and kind of I guess see the matrix a little bit differently or, or whatever it yeah. is um, how did the spiritual awakening let's call it as that uh, show up for yourself mm -hmm. like through your journey oh so I love this question. Um, so I was uh, raised, raised, I'm putting my quotes on, raised in cat, like in a Catholic home, um, meaning my parents were both raised as Catholics growing up in really big Catholic families and then stopped doing anything church related when my brother and I were born. But my grandma, my, both my grandmas um, wanted us to get confirmed. So my parents were good Catholics at that point. So they said, okay, we're going to put our kids through all that. And my brother and I hated it. Like we both were like, nope. This is not for us. God bless anybody out there who that fits for them. Again, I really truly believe there's a million different ways and paths to wherever you're supposed to be. It wasn't for me. And so after that whole thing, I really just said, nope, I'm not interested in organized religion. Um, it, di it didn't speak to me. It didn't talk to my heart. And for a long time, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I didn't, I actually probably was pretty angry. I was really angry at a few things about the Catholic faith. And I used that anger as like a self-righteous shield where I was like, well, I'm not going to do anything. Like I'm hurting somebody by doing that. So if throughout my teen years and probably my early twenties, I just, I, I was pretty self-righteous about all of that, which wasn't helpful. And I went through a pretty big phase of anger in my twenties. I didn't know why I was so mad. I was just like, I was a rageaholic. I just couldn't figure out where to put it and everyone around me kind of got a dose and my relationship suffered and my mental health suffered and my physical body suffered and it was miserable like I didn't understand what I was missing um and it was I mean this is this is I'm not even going to say that um the way I really found myself back in a place of believing in um the divine spirit is by picking up the secret um, I think I was about 26, maybe, and it was like all the rage. And I was like, what is this? I'm such a, like a reader. I was like, oh, I read this. And I just was like, it blew my mind yep. that we are responsible for our lives. <laughs> like, <laughs> my mind. I was it's, like. It's such a simple concept that we should all know and understand. But so many of us, right. as you say, it is all about the external being what's going to show up for ourselves and. You know, it's all going to be handed to us. Oh, my God. It was so, it was revolutionary for me that my anger, my resentment, my blame, my victimization, it was all creating my external reality. And it was nobody else's problem. It was nobody else's responsibility. It was no one else's fault. It was all me. And I had to fix it. And I started right then and there. I, like, memorized, like, the secret, like, the 20 secrets 
whatever the Bible or whatever the secret Bible. I like I read it all the time. I still have it. It's like earmarked all yeah. over, highlighted. Um, I loved it. And from that moment on, I was off and running. And like from that, I found um, Abraham Hicks. And from that, I found like uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. And from that, I found Regan Hillier. And like all of these healers and teachers in our world are spreading this beautiful message of radical responsibility that we all are divine. We all hold the same god spark as the stars as jesus as buddha as you as me like we all have it and that means we're all powerful and that we all have the ability to create but that we're all responsible to each other at the same time like not only are we individually divine but as a collective we're divine and we have to we have to behave as such and so spirituality again it's kind of a word like coach where it's like kind of overused and you know click colloquialism I can't say that word colloquial okay I'm not saying it <laughs> I don't, and I'm thinking shall I give it a go or shall I miss it <laughs> am I gonna mess it up no please? don't try that word um, colloquialism it's, 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 it's over, yeah thank you you got it it's overused and so it, it kind of loses it waters the meaning down and so anytime I talk about spirituality what I really am talking about is our connection our intuition to our higher selves whatever god you choose to believe in um however you define that god however you define her or him or it um is beautiful and as long as you're not hurting other people that is all that matters and i also incorporate this idea of radical responsibility because so often it's really easy in the smallest moments of our life to look at somebody and say you made me mad and it's your responsibility to fix it and i think that's a divine moment that's a divine moment of challenge to say no it's not like it's your it's your job to understand why that made you mad and then to have that conversation with that person yeah. if you need to. So anyways, I just think the divine weaves itself into everything. Like we are not here by accident. Like I think I heard once that uh, it's like one in a four billion percent chance that we're all here. Like scientifically, mm -hmm. this is, it's just a miracle we're here and that we're on this like big rock spinning in this infinite universe. Does nobody think that that's a little weird? Like. <laughs> that this is just our lives so I mean it's it's always just it's it's so vast and and fascinating and that you know at any given moment we could not be here so every day gets to be a day of co-creation and gratitude so that was the other component that I learned a lot about with gratitude and how much it's needed and how much I, my life was um really empty of it I was a pretty big brat I didn't have gratitude for anything so um now that's like my my really uh my gospel is what are you thankful for today like what have you thanked the universe for what have you thanked your parents for what have you thanked your friends for like really focusing on gratitude as much as possible so is that part of a daily practice for yourself as far as writing down gratitudes and, and that side of things mm -hmm. i mean i i try to really be honest with my practices and i'd like to say that i do it every day i don't i i want to I want that to be something I do every day. I do it uh, several times a week and I absolutely every day connect with gratitude, whether it's like on my drive to work or after I sit with a friend or after I have a really wonderful experience or maybe even after I have a terrible experience that I survive, like, you know, just incorporating gratitude wherever it fits um, and wherever it doesn't fit. So yes, writing it, I believe so wholeheartedly in that it really just like, um, it has to be pen to paper and, and that really helps with the manifestation. So anyways, yeah, gratitude, do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's almost like a drop mic moment and then, and that's it. <laughs> gratitude. <laughs> so I just want to dive into like more of the relationship field and that side of things. Um, yeah. I know that there's been a bit of a ups and downs in that area for yourself as well. And, um, we were speaking beforehand and I, and I know that I've had a lot of people come to me who are in, who have been through similar things. So just want to highlight a little bit of, of that journey and, um, how that has really, uh, shaped, evolved, opened up and created you to be who you are. And, and some of the, I guess the internal conversation and chatter that goes on in, through that process as well. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> We've talked about god and we've talked about careers and now we're getting into the juice um so yes uh relationships have been i think 
a really big uh, lesson giver in my life. I think that is true for most people, but uh, I've really, I, I have, I've been through the same lesson many times. And so I'm like, I think I've learned what I needed to learn by now. But um, so I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of, of my history. I was in a relationship with my ex-husband for 11 years. We met when we were 19 and were married when we were 28. So we were together for whatever, however many years that is, eight or nine years before we got married, lived together um, before that. And we were best friends from college. We really just loved each other but we weren't in love with each other if that kind of I mean that always helps people kind of understand the the dynamic of a relationship and we had been together for so long that I didn't even know what life looked like without him like I had no clue and I didn't want to know so you know I kind of threw a gauntlet down when we were like 27 and I was like in or out like what do you want to do and like no good I mean I think Pam Helpert said it best on the office when she goes does any good marriage start with an ultimatum no it does not so um, that's how our marriage started was me basically saying like, shit or get off the pot. And, um, from that moment on, it was a miserable experience. Planning our wedding was terrible. Um, I was so unhappy the whole time. None of this was a red flag on my radar. I was just like, well, this is what you do. Um, we got married and I would say, okay, so we got married in May of 2012. By January of 2013, we were separated. And by uh, May of 2014, we were divorced. So, um, yeah, it's been a really long time since we have seen each other or spoken. Um, but after that, the end of my marriage, we had been separated for two years. I hadn't dated during that period of time. Like, I was really hyper-focused on trying to save our marriage because that's what you do, right? You just try. You try to save it. You go to therapy. You, you know, do all the things. and we were so broken and neither one of us really knew how to fix it. And sometimes it's okay to just say we loved, we learned, and now it's time to move forward. And that's what we decided to do. So um, that was my, um, that was my divorce. And after that, I had two significant relationships and both were really tumultuous for me because I never gave myself any time to heal. Like after that relationship with my ex-husband, I was like, I didn't date in my 20s. I didn't do anything fun. I've been in hell for the last three years. Like, F it. I'm like off <laughs> to the races. Like, I'm going to date like a banshee. I'm on Tinder. Like, <laughs> and I, I, I it, was, it was super fun. But what I didn't know at the time, because I was so like one track minded, is I was hauling everything along with me. And in that, I was attracting people in my life who were broken as me just as broken as I was and they were reflecting this self-worth for myself back so like I had about like an ounce of self-worth and I didn't realize that because I thought oh I'm cute and I have a great job and I am fine I'll be fine like no big deal and what I didn't realize was that this internal work was still left to do so it took two two relationships after my ex-husband for me to kind of wake up and be like whoa like I have repeated this pattern three times what is going on um and so for the last okay so December almost for the last year I have not dated I've just taken a year to myself and I actually at the end of last year went to Bali on a sole vacation to try to decide what I wanted to do about um, a relationship that I had been in and it was the most magical and like inspirational moment of my life where I figured out like so much about who I was and what I wanted and the courage that I came back from from that trip was just like amazing so my relationship story is not over and I don't think it ever is over but what I know about myself now this year has been the biggest gift of my life um I know that I'm okay alone I know that I like myself again I know who I am which allows me to decide if I want to have a partner at some point or like what I actually want rather than just like jumping in a lot of times I think after you get divorced Mm -hmm. it's sort of a race to see who gets remarried first like there's like a it's kind of like it's sort of it's just as unspoken like I'm gonna beat you and um I let that drive a lot of my subconscious behavior and it was so unhealthy so um the last year has been really really important for me and 
and I know that a lot of times people don't need this much time, but I did. And I'm really happy that I took it because it, um, it was like 15 years of healing that had to happen. So <laughs> it was necessary. Um, and through that, I've like worked with a ton of healers. I have been doing, uh, really increased self-care practices, tons of writing, um, reflection like you know spending time with people I love and trust um to kind of give me that mirror reflection like you see shifts and changes in me do you hear how I talk you know like really getting that uh reverberation of like where I'm at in my life so yeah that's that's a little bit of the synopsis of my relationship <laughs> feel free I, to dig into any part of that <laughs> it's a very high level high level there's, there's definitely a couple of things that really shown up uh in the um and I just want to comment, I wish my journey only took a, a year and I didn't even have a, it wasn't 11 years. I've been single for the last four or five years now and on my own journey of trying to <laughs> read stuff on, the, on, on my um, past relationship and things like that, which mm -hmm. uh, whilst wasn't married, was engaged with the, for, for three years, engaged for one. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, uh, and I'm going to get into that part around uh, the key aspect of actually giving yourself time um, to actually go through your own stuff and go through your own baggage just in a moment. But I want to take a step back mm -hmm. a little bit further. You were talking mm -hmm. about now looking back at some of those um, situations that were coming up in and around organizing the marriage and the wedding and, and that side, and they weren't showing up mm -hmm. as red flags. Um, and the reason why mm -hmm. I want to bring this up is I was having a conversation with um, some friends uh, over the last couple of months and, and I've heard these sorts of stories so many times where people even knew standing at the altar, this is not the right mm -hmm. person for them to be at, be with, mm -hmm. but yet they've mm -hmm. still gone through it. And then one of the stories that comes to mind, it was 16 years later that they ended up separating and the, the, the wife knew 16 years prior that this was not going to be the right decision. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think it doesn't actually shake you up enough to actually stop the, the train in its tracks. And mm. yeah, I'll, I'll stop with that and follow on with a different question in a moment. It's a really hard concept and it's so, you're so right. I think many of us can relate to that idea of like, I know my truth and I'm ignoring it. Like I am ignoring the hell out of it because it's too painful. It's too painful to look at. It's too painful to consider. I'm just nervous. I am just, I'm just anxious. I just, I must be making this up. I'm creating this in my, in my head. Like that voice isn't mine. That's my grandma's. Like we make up, <laughs> we make up stories to ignore our truth. Like I remember, um, you know, walking down the aisle and my dad was up, you know, with me and I had my bouquet of flowers, but instead of holding it up, I was like dragging it by my side. <laughs> and my mom like said to me, like, you looked kind of bummed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're, and I was like, shit, like it was on my face. Like, and, and I'll say even like at our wedding, like we didn't spend any time together at our wedding. Like I danced with my cousin the whole night and he was out smoking cigars with his buddies. Like we had like one dance and that was it. And I was like, I, that didn't register as weird to me either. And I was just like, what is, you know, in hindsight, I wasn't happy, but I also wasn't awake. And that would be the other component to what I know better now, like when you know better, you do better, that whole thing. But when I was 26, 27 years old, I had my eye on getting married because that's what you do. And all my girlfriends were getting married and we had done everything together. We had gone to college together. We had gone to high school together. We had our, you know, we had our boyfriends at the same time. We were all getting married. And so I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be and I, I, I just didn't want to go through the pain. I had no idea how I would have survived that pain and obviously I did because I'm here and you can do anything but um I really think that denial is an aphrodisiac or not an aphrodisiac uh an anesthetic that can really work for a long time like to live in a place of denial is a lot less painful than looking your truth in the eye and saying mm -hmm. this is actually what I know like this is actually what I know to be true and that still is hard sometimes. It's still hard to say, I know what I know to be true because when you acknowledge it, you have to act on it because if you don't, it eats you alive. Like, yeah. I think about, I think about moments in my life where I didn't listen and it was like, um, like it was in my like solar plexus and I would be like, I would literally out loud say, shut up, like shut up. I don't want to hear you. And I knew I was going to pay that price later. Yeah. I didn't want to listen. 
right? So it's like that, that if I know what I have to act on it kind of a thing, I think stops people. And nobody wants to be different. Nobody wants to feel pain. As humans, we're biologically conditioned to avoid pain. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we, we flinch, we like retract, we like bob and weave to like avoid any kind of physical pain. And that includes heartache, that includes rejection, that includes disappointment. So I would say those are all reasons we don't listen to our intuition, which is our God giving compass. But I'll tell you, like, it only takes a couple of times to get knocked in the dirt before you start to realize that it's the best gift you could ever have. Like the pain that I've gone through when I haven't listened to my intuition, I, I can imagine is like 10 times greater than if I had just pulled the bandaid off and just gone with it. Like, and just said, yep, I, I'm trusting this. Yeah, absolutely. And if I look at my relationship, it was, I knew within the first uh, six months that it wasn't, I, like we had separated for a little bit and I acknowledged in my own self what was going on for me was that I just didn't feel as though I was appreciated um, just through some of the mm-hmm. actions and things. But I, I too wasn't, wasn't overly awake. I wasn't really in tune with myself and I was mm-hmm. too head over heels in love. And I guess that's where the, the other part of that question was going to go. Like I think when we operate so differently when love is involved, when our heart mm-hmm. is open and when we're vulnerable in that sense, it's it's Mm -hmm. all of a sudden all of our logical mind just goes completely out the window and we're we're operating in such a I don't know like kind of like a gaga gaga like just (laughs) silly things it's like it's like you're high I think they like they they say like being in love is like being in like a cocaine haze like it's like this (laughs) this like really like ah like I just everything's amazing like yeah it's crazy yeah but at the same time if I look back on uh, how challenging that was for myself emotionally, mentally, and everything like that. Like that was that one relationship that really, she was the, she's the one individual who's had the most impact in my life to be who I am today because um, Mm -hmm. I got so kicked to the dirt from an emotional and Mm -hmm. mental perspective, partly of my own doing, but it was still part of the dynamic of the relationship um, Mm -hmm. so that I could rebuild to who I am today and, and going on the path. So whilst yes, there's, you know, as you say, like maybe, back then if they had have been shown up as, as red flags like would you be doing what you're doing now or maybe there was no. um you know that divine lesson that you needed to re- to learn through it and i think there's th- there's a two sides and the reason why i want to highlight that is that you know if somebody is going through something and they've got these red flags um you know obviously there's that two two trains of thought of you know completely walking away um mm-hmm. or maybe there is the other side of there's that lesson that still needs to be learned if you are going to pursue mm-hmm. through it and um you know everything will sort of come out in the wash in the in the long run i totally agree with you yeah like um i i don't think that we can rob anybody from the hard lessons that's something that i've learned um along the way is that people like a, along my path or along my road have held up signs that said like nikki stop or like you need to look at this like oh you're going the wrong way and I would like punch that sign away and I'd be like I'm gonna keep going like it wasn't until I literally had to fall on my face I had to be in like agony for me to be like okay I guess that sign back there was right (laughs) I'm gonna listen to that person next time like I um got out of a really really emotionally and uh psychologically abusive relationship last year and um all my friends were like what are you doing? Like, this is so bad, Nikki. Like, this is not good. Like you're, you're, you're being brainwashed. Like all these things. And I was like, you just don't know him. Like you just don't know. (laughs) And it turned out they were completely right. And so, you know, kind of going back to that idea of having like your board of directors, like, like curating people in your life who you trust. Um, One of my favorite sayings is, we cannot see our own ears. Like we can't, you know, I can't see my own ears. You can't see your own ears, but I can see yours. And so I can tell you like, right, you have ears, like your ears are right there. And like, if you trust me, you really trust that I'm telling you the truth. And so I always say like, take people in your life who are going to tell you that you have ears and know that they're telling you the truth because so often we can't see our own. And um, I have, after this last kind of lesson, I just really, have picked those people that I trust greatly and who I will always listen to because they have my best interests at heart. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm getting text messages. And I want to <laughs> That's all good. 
I don't know how to turn that off. Like, I'm sorry. I'm like, I was trying to figure that out. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah. So, anyways, back to that. But yes, I I agree with you that learning that lesson catapulted me into this year, which has been the most magnificently transformational year of my life. Mm-hmm. And you've just opened another door, which um, I just want to touch on, which is around uh, allowing people to go through their own journey. As far as you know, we can't take the pain away from somebody else or for somebody else. You know, mm-hmm. something that. I've had to personally learn as a, an emotional empath and because, and I imagine probably to some degree yourself as well, like you can see what's going on. And I guess it comes back to the innate uh, coaching side of things as well. We step into mm-hmm. being a coach because we can sort of foresee varying um, paths and directions and, and outcomes and things like that. And mm-hmm. for, you know, for those who maybe it's the mother trying to, you know, support their daughter or, um, you know, friends or, you know, vice versa or whatever the dynamic may be. Um, but sometimes the best uh, lesson or the best support is simply, as you say, just to step back and allow them to, to um, you know, mm-hmm. find the learning and the lesson within it themselves. Mm-hmm. That's the ones that we learn the best, right? I mean, we don't, you know, somebody can tell you, you know, don't eat that fish. I ate that fish yesterday and I got sick. And you're like, oh, it's all fine to me. Like, I'm hungry. Oh, and you'll eat it and you'll bark. So like, <laughs> but you, like we, ha- we have to like, we have to learn lessons that is just like innately built into us as humans. Like we, we can hear people's input. We can, you know, hear what they're having to say, but we also, we need to walk our own path and we have to learn our own lessons. And I would never want to rob somebody of that. You know, I want to support people in being healthy and I will always tell the people I love the truth, but I will never try to make decisions for them because that's not, that's not my journey. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to take that step back to the the part around um, having the break from a relationship, and and as you said, you saw the patterns that were showing up, and then you realized that okay, now I need to step back and just do some work on myself. And um, mm-hmm. and I highlight this because, as I said, like it it's been probably four or five years for myself, and I've I've been on that very similar journey as far as okay, the way that I looked at it, and this I'm not too sure for yourself, but the way that I looked at it is mm-hmm. that I wanted to become whole and complete within myself, so that the next person mm-hmm. that I invite in can complement rather than complete. So that was the mm-hmm. viewpoint in which I was viewing my own world, my own reality, at, like with the, the idea of the relationship side of things as a, I guess, a main focus. Um, mm-hmm. So what was it for you that, that sort of is that main focus in and around giving that time for yourself? I think, I mean, it's, it's so multifaceted. It was about, um, there's so many layers, I guess, like the, I think about the way that I see myself and the, the stuff, like my relationship to my body or the relationship I have to money or the relationship I have to my family, um, my friends, my work, and how this last relationship fragmented all of those things in my life. And I, I allowed that, like I allowed that to happen. I wasn't the keeper of my own house. I wasn't the keeper of my, my own values. And that upset me, like that upset me that like I let that threshold down and I had to take a pretty deep look at like why that was, like why I allowed somebody else to come in and really destroy what I believe in. So for me, the last year has been about repairing that relationship with myself and reestablishing what those non-negotiables are in my life. And like you said, like, how do I see myself as a whole person? I believe we're all whole, but I believe that we all have work. (laughs) like we can be whole and still have work and so a lot of that work has been um loving and listening to myself uh there is this meditation I did earlier this year and it was not revolutionary by any means but it was so poignant and profound to me because it was this woman talking about putting your hand on your heart and a hand on your stomach and telling yourself you that you love yourself (laughs) I mean I don't want to cry when I'm saying this but I might and you repeat I love you I love you. I love you. And like you repeat this over and over and it's like the most profound thing I can do for myself is like give myself what I want other people to give me. And it's, it's so simple, but again, like the simplest things can often be the most difficult to see. And so it was working on that all year and continuing to like the work doesn't end. And I wish there was a different word besides work because it's, it's my pleasure and it is my, like 
divine honor to be here in this body and with this mind and with these privileges to be able to like be so self-indulgent that I get to do this. Like I have the like gift and the ability to take a year of my life to really like love myself like I never have before. And not everybody has that ability at this moment. So I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the tears and I'm grateful for the, the win. Yeah. And I can see how deeply emotionally anchored that is for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. So with that, and I must admit, this has been a bit of a thought that, uh, as I said, because my journey has been for so long and, um, mm-hmm. I think with part of that, it, it comes, I wouldn't want to say creating a sort of standard or a list, but there is, I think it's more of a case of connecting in with your self-worth because you really get to know who you are as an individual and you mm-hmm. get to see that as opposed to everybody's projections of who you are or who you should be, um, by mm-hmm. spending that time alone. And we're still talking in that within the relationship side of things here. Um, mm-hmm. and it, it gets to a point of, actually acknowledging what you will accept and what you won't accept within a relationship. Now I must admit that the part of me has even thought of, well, will I actually find that person now on some level at the same time, I've also accepted. And whenever I say this, people are like, that's so terrible, but this is my truth. I've accepted the idea and the possibility that I may be single for the rest of my life and I may never have a family. And Mm -hmm. for me, I look at that as a powerful place to stand because then I'm not, um, I guess attach the outcome, but I'm also not um, uh, like just being controlled by it. I have the the control over it. Um, And that's not to say that you're not going to have powerful relationships here and there. Like I know for a fact, like this is the start of a powerful friendship, you know, this conversation you and I are having. So, you know, you can still obviously get that fulfillment in other ways as well. But um, Mm -hmm. if we are talking within those intimate relationships, like I'm comfortable with that not actually playing out because I must, I'll be honest, on the other side of my relationship, it actually really shifted my view around relationships of, mm-hmm. I was going into that thinking the whole, you know, till death do, our, do, do us part type mm-hmm. aspect. And mm-hmm. now I'm starting to really connect with the fact that, well, people come into your life for a period of time and whether that's three months, six months, two days, 60 mm-hmm. years, whatever it is, then that is what it is. As long as on each day that you are both powerfully choosing each other and I've got to a level within myself that I won't accept anything less than somebody actually acknowledging me for who I am. Now I'm not coming from an ego perspective when I say that of like, Oh, I'm so amazing. And, and you must bow to me. No, it's not that at all. It's, um, it's, I've been able to connect in with and see who I am on my inner self. And I know for myself that I have that innate ability to be able to see that, that, um, that wonder and the, the beauty with inside of other people. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's just having somebody who sees that and acknowledges that um, in that sort of setting. So um, I guess in and around there, like how is it showing up for yourself? Where are you in that relationship side of things moving forward? Is it something that you've kind of considered because you've saying that being more comfortable with who you are as a, um, you know, being single and everything like that. And, um, but I know there are still a lot of people who are attached with, Oh, I must be in a relationship because therefore this. Um, Mm -hmm. And I used to be that person. I definitely did. <laughs> yeah. And look, transparency, you know, obviously I deeply want it. It's not like I'm, I'm necessarily okay with um, being single for the rest of my life, but I accept it if that is my journey, because I also know that I'm out to achieve some other stuff, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, just maybe share a little bit in for yourself uh, in and around all of that. Definitely. I, I mean, growing up in the Midwest of the United States, and I, I don't think that's un- it's not unique here, but it, it is a cultural thing here, is that like you graduate high school, you go to college, you get married, you have babies, you buy a house, that means happy. And whether you agree with that or not, it's just kind of embedded, it's bred in- inside of you where you're like, this is what I should be doing, this is what I should be doing. And I always like have, as I've said many times, like kind of pushed away the norm as much as I've pulled it in so it's been this push-pull relationship and I love love I love being in love I love having a partner but what I've discovered is that I've done that at the sacrifice of myself and I don't want to do that ever again like I won't um and I think that that rigidity in in what I desire like 
I fear that that might be too much for somebody. I fear that like, if I say to somebody like, that's not actually how I'm going to live my life. They're going to be like, well, you're not lovable. So I think I, I've kind of like, I've, I've stepped into that place with where you are at, I think very similarly, which is I invite love in, I invite relationships in. I hope for a partnership. I, I think it will be a part of my life at some point but I won't live my life based on that being my priority um, because I've done that before and it hasn't turned out well. So I think that you have to play that game because I, I always have to do that inventory of, am I doing this out of fear? Am I doing this out of fear of being hurt again? Am I doing this out of like, like, Oh, I'm so self-righteously single and, blah, 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 and like, I'm better because I can do it alone. Like, like, like I check myself, like I'm not better this is just where I'm at. Like, this is just where my, my roots are planted right now. And like you, I, I hope for love. I hope for partnership, but I'm also realistic about it. Like, I don't necessarily think that each relationship is meant for 60 years of marriage. I just, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I want to leave possibility open for whatever the universe has for me. And I think that, you know, that's what I've learned from, you know, the masters like Abraham and and Wayne and all those all those amazing um healers Louise Hayes like I mean they're they've all said like the second you focus on how it's gonna happen like if you try to clutch it if you try to figure it out like I'm gonna meet my person on tinder or, I'm gonna meet my person at church or I'm gonna you know whatever it's like that's when the desperation sets in that's when the panic sets in that's when the universe is like, dude, I'm trying to give you what you want, but like, you are like tight right now. Like you won't let it in. Like it's not happening. So I try to play pretty loose. Like I just try to keep, you know, my weave loose and whatever the universe has for me, I welcome it. And, you know, like I actually, <laughs> it was like, I was talking to somebody in this world and we we're talking about duality, but like, if you're wanting to call in partnership, you have to really honor duality in your life. And She's like, well, do you have any pictures of single women in your house? And I, I realized in my bathroom, I have these really beautiful um, profiles of, um, they're like nudes of women. And then they're, all, they're, indivi they're like individual women. I was like, oh my God, I do. Like, I have all these pictures of single women everywhere. So I'm, I'm on a tangent. But so, I, you know, I do want relationships because I took those down and I was like, I want to honor duality in my life, but not to my own detriment. So yeah, a very long winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and you talk about that part, like the acknowledging duality and, you know, even to the point of I, I've heard people ask the question, well, is there even space in the wardrobe for his clothes? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then they acknowledge, well, no, there's not. And um, or even the car spot, you know, maybe they're parking in the middle of the carport. Mm -hmm. Like, is there that, mm -hmm. that openness and that, um, that space for that person to come in? And you know, whether you want to believe in it or whether you don't, whatever you want to consider. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. I've also heard on the flip side of those stories of, you know, somebody has shown up, whether it's a couple of weeks later or a couple of months mm -hmm. later, you know, that person mm -hmm. has shown up because of you, if you want to get to, if you don't believe in the two woo woo side of things that of those mere actions, or if you do, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, I do think that it, it is a bit of an unconscious sort of, um, energy mm -hmm. that we are putting out there as to what we are open to and what we're not. And I guess if I look at myself, I'm clearly not open for it yet. <laughs> right. You're like, you're like, I'm clear, dude. Like my garage door is closed. Like I'm not ready yet. Like, which I think we all know, like, again, that's that gut check moment of like, where am I at? You know, I, I was a couple of my girlfriends earlier this summer were like, are you ever going to date again? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I really don't. I go, the thought of going out on a date right now is disgusting. No, I don't. I'd like, I'd rather hang out with you, Ding Dong, or by myself, or like, just not, I don't want to. And what kind of energy would you be going into a date if you're just closed? Like, that's palpable. Like, people would be like, oh, you know, Brett was not that fly to hang out with. Like, he was not open. <laughs> so it's like, you have to be open, right? Like, you have to know that about yourself, which I appreciate a lot. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now I'm mindful of time at the same point, and I and as you said, you acknowledge that you you know you can talk. So like, there's so I much. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, please, no, nothing to apologize. There's just so much more that I really, honestly, want to dive into, especially in and around some of the relationship side of things, mm -hmm. uh, which is not necessarily a a space that I've had a lot of conversations around on on these podcasts. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll have to ravine for another time and just look at some of those specific topics and dive into some of those. Um, I love but, that. 
But for those who are wanting to connect with you, wanting to see more of your content and that side of things, or maybe even reach out to you from a coaching perspective, um, where can they mm -hmm. find you? Yeah, so you can find me um, on, specifically, I'm on Instagram all the time. Like that's my main platform. Um, also on Facebook. So Instagram, my handle is Lux Hippie Lifestyle. My Facebook handle is Nikki Urchel. Uh, Oh my God. But I think I sent it to you. What is It's like a long one. It's like Lux Hippie Lifestyle Coaching and Hereditary Biology or something. I don't know. It's crazy. But we'll put it up. Um, yep. And then my website is Lux Hippie Life, which is probably where you can find all the information about what I do, who I am, my story. Um, I have a blog on there, which I haven't posted on in a while, but has a lot of great content from earlier this year. Um, and I'll be doing a lot more with meditations and programs in the coming months. So I'm really excited to get some of that stuff online for you guys. Yeah, that is super awesome. So one of the questions that I usually close this out with is what is five takeaways and tips that you can give the viewers and they can spend whatever topic area focus that you want them to. Okay. Let's see here. Hold on. My, my ear pads are dying. So I'm going to, I got to, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so five takeaways. Yep. Like, let's see here. I'd say before you get out of bed every single day, thanking whoever you need to thank for your eyes popping open and for, um, your feet on the ground and imagining, um, there's a golden pathway that leads you towards the best opportunities and the, the most amazing high vibrational um, interactions you can possibly have. So like really starting your day off strong with intention. Um, listen and feed your brain and your mind with only the most amazing, love-filled, beautiful things. Podcasts, books, music, um, social media. Uh, curate it like it's your job. Do not feed your mind anything that doesn't make you feel good. If it doesn't make you feel good, get rid of it immediately. It's trash. Um, feed your body the way that you would feed a body that you loved. And that doesn't mean anything except for what it means. Like feed your body the way that you would feed somebody that you love the most in the world. Um, travel to as many different places as you possibly can see the world it makes you a better person it broadens your mind it makes you love people differently it makes you it makes you a better person <laughs> it just does um and do something that scares you if not once a day once a week do a thing that scares you as often as you can it pushes your boundaries it pushes your limitations um and it's the one thing i know that continuously makes me grow and and makes my belief shifts and change that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. I always like doing five because it just stretches for a couple of, uh, you know, gets in the, those last ones are always juicy. Yes, I know. I'm like, was that five? I could keep going. I mean, God, it just shut me off. I put somebody put a quarter in me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I have purely, truly appreciated your, your time and this conversation. And as I said, I have so much knowledge in this that, um, we've dived into in this in this chat and you know there's plenty more that i want to dive into as well so i just want to honor you for who you are as an individual and for who you sh how you show up in this world and the the impact that you're having so thank you so much for being you thank you so much brett this was such a such a pleasure and a joy and just like you know like we said at the very beginning like meeting people brand new people from across the world like what what world is this this is beautiful so thank you so much for um introducing me to your audience and just for you know being an amazing person. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Well, you have a lovely evening and I am going to have a, an amazing day. Yes. Go have a great day on the, on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From the future. From the future. <laughs> Thank you so much. Most welcome. Okay. See ya. Bye-bye.